I want to start this presentation with you and I had the opportunity to go over the participants list ahead of time, okay, and sort of look up some of you and see what you do. And, you know, this is a very diverse audience in terms of your background, your professional experiences, your life experiences, right? And I was trying to identify what is common between you and me and other faculty members and my current students. And I think what's common is our deep connection to the Berkeley ecosystem. And at the same time, I believe that Berkeley has represents many of the ideas that we actually value. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad for this opportunity. In terms of who I am, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from Greece, but that doesn't mean that I don't understand the link between financial leverage and risk, okay? <laughs> I've been at Berkeley Hans since 2010. Uh, I graduated from Yale with a PhD in accounting and finance back then. And that was my first actually re job. I don't want to call it real job because it doesn't feel like it. It feels like a hobby. I really enjoy it. And what I do is I do research and I teach. Um, uh, my specialization is capital markets research with a twist. So I try to combine elements from accounting, finance, economics, law, operations. Basically do what I call intellectual arbitrage, combine ideas from different, different disciplines. And that's basically what I teach in the MBA program and the PhD program. I also act as the field advisor for the accounting group. More recently, um, after I get, began promoted to the level of associate, I started spending more time with the executive program. So now we have a new program of financial analysis for non-financial analysts, for non-financial executives through Berkeley Executive Education, and more recently a program for executives, actually, actually corporate lawyers, who I think should be more aware of accounting and finance when they practice law, right? In terms of kind of my philosophy, and you see how this fits to the theme of today's presentation, there is three main things that I'm trying to achieve through my research and teaching. So the first one is, I think it's the time is ripe to move from analysis to synthesis. So as academics, we spend a lot of time analyzing specific topics, right, and spending a lot of time kind of isolated from other academics, but I think it's time to sort of combine elements from diff different disciplines and move from the specialized knowledge of a specific topic to kind of synthesizing different ideas. Okay, as I said, the time is ripe to break down the silos, all right? The second is this idea of moving from theory to practice. So instead of me producing papers and research that is only appealing to other academics and consumed by my peers, I want to be able to sort of bring academics and practitioners closer to each other. So produce research that will actually have real life implications, all right? And finally, you know, when I teach and when we teach, I don't really want to give away all the answers. I want to give a framework to people to think for themselves and be able to ask the right questions. Because I realize that, you know, we don't, we don't really have all the answers, but maybe we're going to be able to give a framework to people to be asking the right questions. Once you frame the question properly, 80% of the problem has already been solved, okay? So what keeps me up at night? So I'll give you a few questions. So the first question that kind of keeps me up at night, believe it or not, is basically what is the value of a corporation? What is driving value creation on the corporate level? How do market prices relate to fundamental values? How does the market understand corporate value creation? How can we use financial education to facilitate decision making for small individual investors? How can we use financial education to promote the efficiency of the market mechanism? And finally, how can we use financial education to improve the allocation of capital in society? So these are big questions, and that's why they keep me up at night. So I don't really have answers to them, but I'm working on it. It's work in progress. I think it will take me a lifetime. So in terms of what I want to talk about today, is first of all, you guys graduated in the mid 60s, and that was a really exciting time at Berkeley, but it was a really exciting time for financial economics in general. So I want to reflect a little bit as to what happened over the last 50 years or so in terms of the market mechanism or our perception of the market mechanism, moving from the idealistic view of the 1960s to a more realistic representation of today. Then I want to talk about investor protection and the role of financial education. And finally, I want to define the problem of access inequality and argue that actually Berkeley has can be at the forefront of finding a solution to this problem. 
That's not income inequality, this is access inequality. I'm going to define it. Okay? Excited? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the 60s. And all I know is kind of secondhand information, okay? But here is my understanding of how financial economists used to view capital markets back in the 60s. Well, at the time, people believed, and financial economists in particular, many of them used to be affiliated with the University of Chicago, that the market mechanism is an incredible telecommunication mechanism that aggregates and disseminates information that is otherwise dispersed in society. Okay? So it's this incredible mechanism that is super efficient, perfect, to the point that the price is right. So if you look at the stock market and price of any corporation, that price it has to be a, a perfect representation of the true value of the company, at least on average. At the time, financial economists believe that any deviations of prices from value, those deviations are you know, random errors, and on average, they cancel out. Okay? So very idealistic. At the time, financial economists believe that what you see is what you get, so therefore the price should be your best guess of the value of a corporation. Now very quickly this idea led to a philosophical paradox. The paradox which is still relevant today is the following. If investors can get everything they need just by looking at prices, then why would anyone spend any time collecting data, processing data, aggregating data to try to understand what value should be. You can just get it all by looking at prices. But if, if that's true, and everybody thinks the same way, then nobody would bother with doing their homework because you can get it all by looking at prices. But if that's true, how can prices be efficient to begin with? So in other words, this whole idea of perfection this idealistic view of perfection was actually floated on philosophical grounds. That the price cannot be right always, because if that's true, the price cannot be right to begin with. So today, 50 years later, financial economists are less uptight and more open to the idea that actually the market mechanisms can fail and prices can deviate from values. So today's view is that there is room for improvement. And it took us 50 years as academics to kind of acknowledge that. And the idea is that actually prices can deviate from values and that these deviations are not random but rather systematic. And that's very relevant to the Bay Area because those deviations of prices from value are more likely to happen when there is room for speculation. In other words, companies that are young, high growth, technology companies, for, and I'll give you an example from yesterday, for which there is tremendous uncertainty about their true value, well, these are exactly the companies for which the price is more likely to be right. And even worse, these are exactly the companies for which individual investors, unsophisticated investors, are more likely to make mistakes and overpay for these companies, okay? Now, this is especially important for a Berkeley Haas professor in finance and accounting because that implicates or suggests that there is going to be a transfer of wealth from those who don't know to those who know. There's going to be a transfer of wealth from unsophisticated to sophisticated investors, okay? So let me give you an example. And I know that most of you don't tweet, but I think all of you, none of you, actually use Snapchat. I didn't. So I'll give you the example of a very hard to value company. And a technology company that's actually based in LA, okay? And it's young, it's growing like crazy in terms of revenue. At the same time, they experience losses because they have to invest a lot in new technology, all right? And the, clear to success, the path to success is not very clear. So the company is called Snap, and their main product is Snapchat, and I'll give you an example as to how it works. This is an image, image messaging mobile application that you can download on your phones, all right? That uses an incredible technology behind it, computer vision technology, that basically does the following. You can scan your face, okay? And the application will locate features on your face, facial features, 
to create coordinates for very, very silly filters. Okay? So let me give you an example. So this is me and my girlfriend. Okay? So we, I had to download the application because I've never used it. So you download the application, you sort of use your camera on your smartphone, it takes a photo and then it applies a really stupid filter. I don't really know the name of it. Here's another one. Okay? So that's all it does. And now the question is, what is the value of a company that, you know, just take pictures and applies this kind of silly filters using an incredible technology in the background, but that's all it does. And the way they generate revenue is through advertising, right? But they have to invest so much in this technology to be able to create these silly filters. What's the value of this company? How much would you pay for this company? Okay. Well, it's really hard to tell because there's tremendous uncertainty about the future. How are they going to be able to make money? What's going to be the path to a sustainable profitability rate? This is not like U.S. Steel that I met one of you that used to be affiliated with U.S. Steel. Right? This is a company for which the value is up in the air. Their product is very intangible, very hard to understand, really hard to monetize. And I'm not the only one who says that. Actually, they acknowledge it, not publicly, openly in a, in a, in a, in a, in a luncheon event, but rather in their filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Actually, from their filings with the SEC, their management itself says, hey guys, we've been experiencing losses in the past, we will continue to experience losses in the future, and we may never achieve or maintain profitability. Okay? Now, you guys have a lot of experience, all right? How many of you would invest in this company? Would you? Would you? Maybe not, right? I mean, unless you tell me how are you going to become profitable, how are you going to monetize this user base, where does the value come from, why would I invest with you, okay? Well, it turns out that the company entered the public capital markets in March of 2017. That's nearly nine months ago. Okay. And actually, once the company was listed in the New York Stock Exchange, many people started buying the stock. Why? Because they like the filters. Okay, they make you look nice or stupid. Right? It's, 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 it's an interesting application. But this is the reason to buy the stock that may be a reason to download the application, but that's not the reason to buy the company. Do you think that was a good idea? Maybe not. Actually, some of, my, some of the people who didn't sign up for my class, MBA students, ended up buying the stock, <laughs> but not my students. Turns out that was a horrible idea. Okay, and let me give you a chart because I know you can take it. Okay. So this is March of 2017. This is today, okay, literally today, okay. Now, suppose that one of my the MBA students who didn't take my class were to invest one dollar back in March. Well, this blue line over here indicates that fast forward to today, that guy will have 55 cents left. Now, suppose the same dollar, suppose he were to invest, or she were to invest the same dollar in the stock market index. This is the line over there. Well, the same dollar would generate nearly $1.10 by today. So look at the gap over here. Huge, right? So who lost? Somebody lost. So the people who bought in the aftermarket, after March, they lost. At the benefit of who? of the more sophisticated investors. So clearly here there was a significant transfer of wealth. We're talking about billions of dollars, right? Up here in March, the market value of the company was over $25 billion. Today is you know, nearly 12 and a half, $13 billion. That's a loss of $12 billion in less than nine months from one company. This is significant because it's not gonna be the black rocks, the sophisticated investors of this world are going to lose their money. It's going to be the little individual investors that are going to experience a significant transfer of wealth from themselves to the more sophisticated investors, right? So that's important because this case was happening in real time during my class. 
So we were tracking this class in real, this case in real time, and most of my MBA students were able to anticipate that this is going to happen, that there is a bubble that is going to burst, so they stayed away from the company, but many people were not taking my class or didn't have the opportunity to be at Berkeley Haas and actually invest the company and they lost a significant amount of wealth. Okay. Now you might say that this is a special case, it's an outlier, these things don't happen on a regular basis. Well, it turns out that that would be a false claim because this, is, this case is actually consistent with more systematic evidence and that's something that we see in our research. And actually we see that systematically individual investors are more likely to overpay, pay too much for difficult to understand, hard to value corporations. Okay. I have several other examples. So Snapchat was this year, GoPro, Fitbit. Many companies that year after year, they keep giving to me in terms of case studies for my class because they're spectacular. You know, we see them crashing in real time. The MBA students love it. You know, they see these rapid price declines. They come back to class excited. People are losing money. We didn't, okay? It makes them excited. It's good for my ratings. <laughs> But there is a big lesson to be learned here because, you know, one of the questions that comes up is where, what is the role of capital market gatekeepers, the guardians of individual investors, and where are they in this process, okay? Well, I'm going to argue in the next slide that the traditional capital market gatekeepers, the guardians of the system, actually suffer from conflicts of interest, and these conflicts get in the way of protecting individual investors, okay? Let me give you an example. Investment banks, well, they don't really work for individual investors. The incentives of those companies, of these banks, is to please the management so that they maximize the chance that they generate more revenue in the future. And that's how it works, so good for them. The analysts, the sell-side analysts, Wall Street, well, they also have strategic incentives for bias, and actually, while these companies are declining, the analysts are heavily promoting these companies, and they say buy, 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 but at the same time, you know, the prices are coming down. And finally, when it comes to the more sophisticated arbitrageurs, the short sellers, they can't do much about it because of all kinds of frictions in the market. So in this market setting, in a market setting where prices can deviate from fundamental values, the question I ask is, what is the role of financial information analysis? Well, financial information analysis, at least the way we teach it at Haas, is a framework to think about value creation in a setting where prices can deviate from values. It can serve individual investors and sophisticated investors alike in terms of helping them make more informed investment decisions and avoid overpaying for speculative stocks, avoid making those mistakes. But importantly, financial information analysis can serve for society in terms of making prices more efficient and improving the allocation of capital in society. But here's the problem. Financial information analysis, while it is the key to sound investment decision making, not everybody has access to it. Okay, and now we're getting closer to kind of the crux of this presentation. On one hand, you have the institutional investors who have access to models and processing power and vast amounts of data, okay? On the other hand, you have individual investors who don't really have access to that, and they, they oftentimes they make decisions without any financial analysis. So of course, in this kind of game, you know who's gonna lose. So the problem is access inequality to financial information analysis. And as a result of this problem, individual investors make mistakes and lose their savings. So here's the problem. This is not the problem of income inequality, although it kind of reinforces one another. This is the problem of access inequality. What's the solution? Well, the solution I propose is to democratize the power of financial information analysis through the combination of financial education and financial technology. Well, it's possible because recent innovations allow us to automate and simplify the process, the financial analysis process. How? Through the combination of big data and data analytics. Effectively, people like me can take care of all the dirty work in the background and give access to the masses, to individual investors, to guided financial analysis, okay? 
Now that implies effortless data collection, aggregation, and dissemination, okay? So here how it, it, I think it's gonna work. By providing access to guided financial analysis, which is kind of automating the entire process, we can improve the investment decision making and as a result mitigate the problem of access inequality and therefore democratize the power of financial analysis. So it's very simple. I think this is the time. Why? Because access inequality is on the rise and the need for individual investor protection is burning. Okay? At the same time, the combination of finance and technology is completely changing the landscape of financial services. And that creates an opportunity for us to reshape the investment landscape for individual investors. Okay? This is not just access to trading. This is access to informed decision making. And here is my last slide. I think this is a huge opportunity for Berkeley House. Why? Well, we can be at the forefront of the solution to the problem of access inequality. Why? Well, first of all, we have the knowledge. Second, we have the right culture. Dean Lyons talked about the defining principles that have been sort of characterizing our culture for decades and that he codified seven years ago, I guess. Well, I think that kind of effort would fit extremely well within that framework. Why? Because we're going to be questioning the status quo on behalf of individual investors, okay? At the same time, we're going to be going beyond ourselves in terms of promoting investor protection, which I think is a great, great mission. And of course, you know, while we're doing that, we're going to be confident in our financial analysis skills, but not with attitude, okay? Now, with that, I want to close it, and I want to open up for questions. Yes? Please give us your guesstimate of the financial future of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, I work quite a bit with the Berkeley Law, and now they have a program on uh, cryptocurrencies. It, these are executive programs, three-day executive programs. So I asked them, what do, they, what do you guys teach? It's like, oh, you know how to value cryptocurrencies? I'm like, do you know actually how to value those? because I don't. For now, it's pure speculation. Now, some of my friends put some money early on, and that paid quite well, but it's really hard to understand where the value comes from and how prices will move in the future, you know? I would be a liar if I were to sort of say that just because I teach valuation, I do my research in valuation, I know how this thing is gonna be valued, because it's, to me, it's pure speculation at this point. The technology behind it, I think, is fascinating. Right? But in terms of the actual price, it's really hard to tell you know, what's driving it, other than animal spirits. <laughs> other questions? Yes? For the real risk prefer, were there some companies that didn't tank, the way you gave us one example? Were there some who soared? Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? So, and so should you give us a, really an aggregate of all of it in order to see which is the better thing to do? I, I love that. So the average experience actually is consistent with this one example. That's why I showed it. But there is always exceptions to the rule. So for example, you know, if you look at Google, Facebook, some of this companies which I call corporate Einsteins, right? So these are the corporate Einsteins, almost the outliers that behave different from the norm, but we can't be treating everyone as a corporate Einstein because most companies will behave like the norm, and that's how the norm is being shaped, right? And this is something that I always have to fight with my MBAs to convince them because they always focus on the salient examples of companies that have been extremely successful, right? Those corporate Einsteins, but not everybody is going to be that. But the average experience is consistent with this example. Yeah, it's kind of a case study. Does your objective um, disagree with the theory that the market cannot be forecasted by all these Nobel Prize winners? Well, that's how it started, right? The idea of uh, prices are a random walk and they're impossible to predict. That was the pervasive view in the 90s, in the mid 60s. Started with Eugene Fama at the University of Chicago and here in the Nobel a few years ago. 
Um, but on average, that statement may be true, but there is pockets within the universe of commons that, are, that exhibit predictability in terms of the mistakes that people do. So yeah, it deviates from the view of 100% market efficiency and allows the possibility for systematic mistakes. And we see that in our research, that people tend to make mistakes in a very systematic way, and that's especially true for individual investors. And for me as an academic and, and an educator, creates the opportunity and the urge to try to protect these investors through financial education. Because people can learn, okay? Final question. What, what is your uh, track record of applying this uh, theory to individual stocks? Well, um, I'm not going to talk about my track record. I'm going to talk about my, the track record of our MBA students. So I have I maintain a website, not with my investment ideas, because that would be too narcissistic, but rather with the ideas of, our, of my MBA students. And year after year after year, they are able to pick up these cases. Now, that doesn't mean that those happen all the time, right? But they do happen. And our MBA students actually, with a little bit of financial analysis and a little bit of financial education, they're able to pick those cases up and protect their savings and avoid for, from overpaying for those cases. So it's a framework that seems to be facilitating the investment process. And it's a framework that needs to be accessible to everyone. Follow up? No, I understand it. We can talk more about it. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess this is it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You're amazing.